Hello and welcome to Tag Tuesday in which I discuss the Moments in Time book tag. This tag was created by Paul of PK's Books who tagged me. I will include a link to his channel in the show notes below. Paul asks, can you describe five moments from books that have stayed with you and why they have struck such an emotional chord? Moment number one is when Marie Melmott is jilted by Sir Felix Carberry in The Way We Live Now by Anthony Trollope. She's such a feisty, worthy girl who is in love with a worthless swine. She is such a spirited, lovely girl that she deserves to be loved by a worthy man. That she is not is heartbreaking. In book one, Marie had fallen in love with the handsome Sir Felix Carberry and he had intimated that he would speak to her father. He is penniless and she is an heiress, so Felix Carberry had made up his mind to marry her for her money. <coughs> Felix Carberry was standing leaning against a wall and she was seated on a chair close to him. I love you more than anyone in the world, he said, speaking plainly enough for her to hear, perhaps indifferent as to the hearing of others. Oh, Sir Felix, pray do not talk like that. You knew that before. Now I want you to say whether you will be my wife. How can I answer that myself? Papa settles everything. May I go to Papa? You may if you like, she replied in a very low whisper. It was thus that the greatest heiress of the day, the greatest heiress of any day, if people spoke truly, gave herself away to a man without a penny. Now we fast forward to book two. Hetta Carberry, the sister of Felix, has been sent to break some bad news to Marie. Miss Carberry, Marie said, this is so good of you, so good of you. I do so love you for coming to me. You said you would love me. You will, will you not? And Marie, sitting down by Miss Carberry, took her hand and encircled her waist. Mr. Melmott has told you why I have come? Yes, that is, I don't know. I never believe what Papa says to me. To poor Hetta, such an announcement as this was horrible. We are at daggers drawn. He thinks I ought to do just what he tells me, as though my very soul was not my own. I won't agree to that, would you? Hetta had not come there to preach disobedience, but could not fail to remember at the moment that she was not disposed to obey her mother in an affair of the same kind. What does he say, dear? Hetta's message was to be conveyed in three words, and when these words were told, there was nothing more to be said. It, it must be all over, Miss Melmott. Is that his message, Miss Carberry? Hetta nodded her head. Is that all? What more can I say? The other night he told me to bid him send you word, and I thought he ought to do so. I gave him your message, and I've brought back the answer. My brother, you know, has no income of his own, nothing at all. But I have, said Marie, with eagerness. But your father, it does not depend upon Papa. If Papa treats me badly, I can give it to my husband. I know I can. If I can venture, cannot he? I think it is impossible. Impossible? Nothing should be impossible. All the people that one hears of that are true to their loves never find anything impossible. D does he love me, Miss Carberry? It all depends on that. That's what I want to know. She paused, but Hetta could not answer the question. You must know about your brother. Don't you know whether he does love me? If you know, I think you ought to tell me. Hetta was silent. Have you nothing to say? I don't know what I am to say. He will not try again, you think? I'm sure he will not. My brother is sure that he cannot, cannot, cannot love me, Hetta. Say it out if it is true. It is true, said Hetta. Then he's a brute. Tell him that I say that he's a false-hearted liar, that I trample him under my foot. Maria, she said this, thrust her foot upon the ground as though that false one was in truth beneath it, and spoke aloud as though regardless of who might hear her. I despise him, despise him. They are all bad, but he's the worst of all. To think that he was a liar all the time, that I can't bear. Then she burst into tears. I've had to abbreviate the passage, but the whole of chapter 68 is a magnificent but tragic tour de force of heartbreak and its consequences. 
Moment number two is when Bombellini is elected mayor in The Secret of Santa Vittoria by Robert Crichton. Mussolini is dead and Bombellini invites a group of his friends into his wine shop for a celebratory drink but his wife insists that they pay. She's a shrew and Bombellini is henpecked. She treats him with disdain and has no respect for him. She considers him to be merely a clownish, idle and worthless character. All he wants is to be left alone and to have some peace and quiet. He refuses to ask his guests to pay, but Rosa Bombellini removes the glasses and turfs them all out. Bombellini goes to bed. The next day, he climbs the water tower to paint over Mussolini's name and becomes the town hero. They decide to oust the fascist town council and to appoint a new mayor. Unknown to any of them, and especially to his own wife, Rosa, there are hidden depths to Bombellini. This is revealed when he quotes the master to Fabio, his daughter's boyfriend. You know what the master says? Men are apt to deceive themselves in big things, but they rarely do so in particulars. I don't know who the master is. Niccolo Machiavelli, Bombellino said. He's my master. Have you studied him? Fabio said that he had. Well, I read him. I memorize him, the wine seller said. I have read The Prince 43 times. The young man was astonished by this information and he didn't believe it. His father had once told him that beneath Bombellini's clownish exterior there was a better mind than anyone could expect, but Fabio had never been able to see any sign of it. When Bombellino climbs down from the tower, he's, he is as drunk as a skunk and shouts out, free wine for the people of Santa Vittoria. The townspeople put him in a cart and push him into the piazza. At the town hall, the fascist council are waiting apprehensively to discover what is going to happen to them when they surrender. The townspeople are shouting out his name as they are claiming a king. My goodness, Dr. Burr said, he comes like a king from the east. The townspeople are unaware that the council is trying to surrender, but through his drunken haze, Bombellini has grasped the situation completely. To the leader's mansion, he called. The leader of the council surrenders to Bombellini and before the townspeople are aware of what has happened, Bombellini has been acknowledged as the new mayor. They are incredulous and some are scornful, but Bombellini turns to the people and with just four words is accepted by them. Those four words are, and now your wine. Bombellini forms a new council and with great skill and ingenuity saves the livelihood of the whole town when he develops a scheme to hide and preserve the town's valuable stock of wine from the German invaders. Moment number three is Dr. Grantley at his father's bedside in Barchester Towers by Anthony Trollope. I've already written about this in a previous video, but it is such a moving and memorable moment that I will describe it again, but briefly. Dr. Grantley is the Archbishop of Barchester and he hopes to be appointed to the bishopric on the death of his father. But by no means easy were the emotions of him who sat there watching. He knew it must be now or never. He was already over 50 and there was little chance that his friends who were now leaving office would soon return to it. No probable British Prime Minister but he who was now in, he who was so soon to be out, would think of making a bishop of Dr Grantley. Thus he thought long and sadly in deep silence and then gazed at that still living face and then at last dared to ask himself whether he really longed for his father's death. The effort was a salutary one and the question was answered in a moment. The proud, wishful, worldly man sank on his knees by the bedside and taking his father's hand within his own prayed eagerly that his sins might be forgiven him. Moment number four is Dante's meeting the Abbey Ferraia in the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Edmund Dante's had become the unwitting victim of a conspiracy and had been consigned to the Chateau d'If, where he has been languishing for four or five years, unaware of the reason for his incarceration. The Abbey Ferraia is an is in an adjacent cell and has been tunnelling an escape route for a number of years but has taken a wrong route and instead of the castle wall ends up at Dante's cell. 
Dantes hasn't spoken to anyone except his jailer for all those years and is delighted and thrilled to hear another human voice. They form a master-pupil relationship and eventually the Abbey Friar is able to enlighten Dantes as to why he was imprisoned. Dantes is filled with feelings of revenge and the Abbey regrets enlightening him. When after another 10 or 12 years the Abbey is dying, he reveals the secret of Monte Cristo to Dantes and implores him to use the great wealth of Monte Cristo to do good if he should if he should ever escape. The means and opportunity for Dantes to carry out his intention of revenge are thus placed in his power and the story continues from there. Moment number five is Gabriel Oak discovering his dog has run his sheep over a cliff in Far From the Madden Crowd by Thomas Hardy. One night when Farmer Oak had returned to his house, believing there would be no further necessity for his attendance on the down, he called as usual to the dogs, previously to shutting them up in the outhouse till next morning. Only old George responded, the other could not be found. Later in bed, Oak heard the sound of his flock running with great velocity. He jumped out of bed, dressed, tore down the lane through a foggy dawn and ascended the hill. On the extreme summit of the chalk pit, he saw the young dog standing against the sky, dark and motionless, as Napoleon at St Helena. A horrible conviction darted through Oak. With a sensation of bodily faintness he advanced. At one point the rails were broken through and there he saw the footprints of his ewes. The dog came up, licked his hand and made signs implying that he expected some great reward for signal services rendered. Oak looked over the precipice. The ewes lay dead and dying at its foot. A heap of 200 mangled carcasses representing in their condition at least 200 more. The sheep were not insured. All the savings of a frugal life had been dispersed at a blow. His hope of being an independent farmer were laid low, possibly forever. He leant down upon a rail and covered his face with his hands.